Hey family, I'm PT, Pastor Tore Roberts, and the lead pastor of the Potter's House at 1 LA in Denver. And on behalf of my wife, Pastor Sarah and myself, we want to welcome you to our channel and to this word. I cannot wait for you to hear what God has for you in this message. I want to tell you a few things really quickly. Subscribe. If you're not already subscribed to this channel, subscribe so that you can be made aware of all of the word that's coming at you week in and week out. And also turn on your notifications so you don't miss a morsel that comes forth. We're also grateful for you and your partnership. If you are so uh, compelled, we invite you to support what we're doing, not just our church, but what our church is doing. There are a number of outreaches, a number of things, critical, necessary things that we support and we're able to do it because of your generosity. So without further ado, let's get right into this word. God bless you. I'll see you soon. Family, welcome to Activate LA. Thank you for taking this time, this opportunity to join us as we have yet another powerful and amazing encounter with the Word of God. What makes this so special is the fact that we all come together, we are all of one accord, and we all have an expectation that God is about to do something incredible in our lives, in our mind, and in our spirit. And as we are of one accord, let's go ahead, get down in the comments where you are tuning in from. And while you're jotting down where you're tuning in from, don't be afraid to share this message. Bring somebody in, bring a friend in, let them know what Activate has been doing in your life and what Activate can do in their lives as well. So go ahead, I wanna see some area codes, I want the country codes, I want the city, state, country, shout it out, where are you at right now? Iowa, shout me down. Uh, Alaska Anchorage, shout me down. I don't care where it is, shout me down. This is a movement that is truly not just national, not just international, it's all over the globe. And I love to be able to share this with everybody who's involved because you wanna know that you are part of a family that's even bigger than where you are. It's all bigger than you. It's always, it's always bigger than you. See, y'all trying to get me to preach a whole other word that wasn't even the word I have for today. We'll save that one for later. But go ahead, say hello to everybody in the comments. Throw a hand up, throw a hand up. Put a hand in the comments. You're here, you're here, you're here, you're here. You are here. Now let's get the ball rolling. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have set the stage. You have allowed for a moment in a time such as this where your word can do that which only it can do, where your presence can do that which only it can do, which is to stir up the gift in your people, to bring forth a, a sense and a spirit of discernment, to see the world differently because they see the word differently. Father, we thank you in advance for what you have already done. We receive it and we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 family. Let's go to work. Uh, today, I want to come to you from a couple of passages, but we will start here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13 and 11. We're coming out of the King James Version, and the good word says, Finally, brethren, farewell. Become, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Whew. I love this message. If you're taking down your notes, uh, today we're going to speak from the place of crack the code. I'll get into why I called that, that message, that title in a second. But I love this passage because it, it sounds like such a peaceful and, and, and such a, a well-wishing sort of salutation. This is Paul speaking to the church of Corinth. And he's written this letter. And Paul and the church of Corinth had this really fascinating relationship where he comes and he teaches and he preaches and they get it for a little bit and then they fall. And then he comes back and he preaches and he teaches. And you have to understand, Paul is the master communicator. Paul is the master communicator. He not only has a, a great and a, a masterful hold on the word and the power of God, but he has a heart for the people. 
And so for him to he keep coming back to Corinth over and over because they kept falling and Cor the church of Corinth had so many issues. They struggled with differing doctrines within different interpretations of the word. Uh, they had disagreements about the resurrection and the power of Jesus. There was lust going on in the church. At some point, people were just suing each other. And Paul kept having to come back and say, people, get it together. I love that Paul had this kind of patience. I wish we all had this kind of patience with ourselves. But Paul finally does this. This is the last correspondence he has with the church of Corinth. And he loves them. But he knows that they have to get to a place where they are walking consistently and unified together in the word of God for the purposes of God. So he sends this brilliant, beautiful letter where he explains uh, all of who Christ is and their role according to what Christ has done with the resurrection in their lives. And then he finishes with this. And so I find this message incredibly important because Corinth had an identity problem. Family, at the end of the day, the reason they struggled so much is because they had an identity problem. And I think any one of us at any given point in time can relate to where the world has its own incredible and wild perspective. And if you study the world and you get caught up in all the events and everything that's happening, it can be really disconcerting. And it can get to the point where you can literally forget who you are. So much news is happening. So many events are happening. And so many differing, differing opinions are happening that if you're not taking care, you can lose what's center for your core in terms of what God has spoken into you in a given moment. And this is what was happening with the church of Corinth. So Paul recognizes this and he says, I've got to send the people something once and for all that's going to allow them to look at this particular letter and understand this teaching and, and restore their identity to, to their minds and to their hearts. So he starts off, he ends, I'm sorry, with this passage. He says, farewell, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. It sounds like such a beautiful salutation. It's like a love letter to the, to the people he's been teaching and preaching to for years. But if you look a little deeper, it's cold. And I found it so fascinating because when Paul writes this letter, he's in prison. And so for him to send this letter was, was a pretty big deal because you, have to, you don't know who's going to open this letter. You don't know who's going to read this letter. So he sends this letter, which on the surface seems very chill and very warm and very loving. And then as we dig into the text on this journey tonight, we're going to understand that this was cold for identity. This was code for an awakening. This was code for the church of Corinth to remember their DNA. So why? So the reason Paul was sending this was because he needed them to crack the code so that they could finally get to the place where the issues inside of the church would stop stalling their movement in their walk with God. This was so much bigger than just well wishes. Even the word farewell, as he says this, he sets it up because we think of farewell as goodbye. Actually, when you break this down, it's farewell, it's two words, to fare well, meaning do well, be well. This wasn't just goodbye, Mwah, you guys, I love you guys so much, and out the door. He was instructing the church of Corinth from the first word. He said, listen, you have to be well. You have to do well amongst yourselves. And I want to look at four specific words. I call them the states of being. There are four states that, that Paul really gets into in this word. And when you break down those four states, he is revealing the code. He's revealing the genetic code for the people of God. And I know I'm talking to you right now when I say this. Right now in this world, I can't think of a better time for us to be reminded of our DNA. It's not enough to just know the name. It's not enough just to know your name. 
earlier, I said, shout out your country, shout out your place, shout out where you're from. And these are all markers of our identity. But at the core, as a believer, there is a DNA. And the DNA trumps all of these details that we sometimes place with more importance than our DNA. So Paul has given us some code wrapped into this letter. I want to start from the very first, uh, from the very first part of, the, of this verse. He says, be perfect. And I love this because we think of the word perfect and we just want everything to be, well, perfect. No mistakes, uh, nothing to be corrected. It's, it's, it's interesting because if you think about it, most of us want to be perfect just so, and this is going to sound wild, some of us want to be perfect just so we can stop being corrected by God. Mmm, I just hit somebody in the chest. I felt it. It's okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. There is a, 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 a hunger for perfection that does not come from chasing after God, but literally you just get tired of God correcting mistakes. You get tired of making mistakes and we get tired and we get weary of hearing from God and having to make changes on the inside of us and changes on the outside of us. So we say, you know what? If we're perfect, we don't have to make any more changes. If we're perfect, no more convicting words. If we're perfect, life will be perfect and we'll be happy, happy, we'll be comfortable, and it'll just be, oh, this is so wonderful, life is so great and it's beautiful, and we'll all skip through lilies and be happy and high-five each other. But that's not what the whole point of this walk with God is about. So when he says be perfect, I had to look up this word, and one of the definitions is state of repair. So he says, in terms of being perfect, the first state of being I want us to pay attention to is we are to be perfected. This is a part of our DNA. The first state of being we should pay attention to, as it's listed here, we are to be perfected. Now, being perfected doesn't mean everything is perfect and there's nothing wrong with our lives. Being perfected means we are consistently and constantly in a state of repair. We are consistently and constantly being adjusted to get to the place of being whole. We're always being adjusted. We're always being realigned. We are always on the potter's wheel. And this was God's vision for us being perfected. And I love that Paul sneaks this in because the church of Corinth had gotten to a place where they were tired of making adjustments. Who am I talking to right now? You are tired of making adjustments. You are tired of the convicting word and you just wanna lay down and be. Here is why we're here tonight. Because what I wanna tell you is as bad as you wanna lay down and be, trust me, I've been there. I know what it's like to get to a place where you just want to not have to make any more adjustments. But that's not God's vision of being perfected. And here's why I can smile when I say it. Because when you're being perfected, you are with the master craftsman. When you're being perfected, you are closer to God than you would be than if you weren't. When you are being perfected, when you're being adjusted, when God is working on you, it means his hands are on you. You are as close to God as you can possibly get, and that's the best place we can possibly be. That's perfect. Perfect is where I'm so close to God, he can just reach out and touch me. I'm right there, and I'm ready for him to do whatever surgery is necessary on the inside of me. Perfect is not getting off the potter's wheel out of our own strength. Being perfected, a state of being perfected is I'm on the potter's wheel. I'm here to be shaped. I'm here to be molded. I'm here to be corrected. I'm here to constantly, consistently make adjustments because it means I'm paying attention to who I am. And as long as I'm paying attention, I can bring to God what's wrong, and I know the master mechanic will fix it. 
I think of it this way. Uh, one of the things I had to, to really start to enjoy and, and figure out was taking my car to the dealership. Now, depending on what your experience is, this is not a fun thing. And I'm not out here saying you should take your car in every week because that's a fun thing. No, 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 no. But what I am saying is this. It brought me more aware of the problems that could or might arise or had already taken place. So now I bring my vehicle to the dealership and the best part was it was, it was the kind of cool dealership where there was lounges, there was chairs, there was food, they had really great donuts, they had popcorn, they had free Wi-Fi. It was fun. I actually got to a place where I was like, oh, you know, babe, I gotta go fix the, you know, defibrillator flux capacitor, sure, gotta go. And I was like, cool. I would pack my stuff, I would get work done there. My point being this, when you bring that which is broken on the inside of you to God, the presence of God is a whole and incredible experience. And the presence of God, when you bring that which is broken to be perfected, that experience is worth more than anything you could possibly have before you came in. So when we now think of perfected, I want us to think I'm constantly in a state of, of repair. I'm constantly in a state of being adjusted. I'm constantly in a state where God, I've now discovered that there's something on the inside of me that isn't in alignment with your vision. Now me and you can partner and work together on this thing on the inside of me. You get to co-labor with God. I want us to see being perfected as an opportunity and not an escape. So the first state of being that Paul is trying to get the church of Corinth into is to get to be perfected. And I want us to, 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 to continue to hold this dear to our hearts because perfection can be a trap if we're only using it so that we can no longer have God do all the hard work on us. I honestly believe that the reason we struggle with this idea of being perfected is because at the end of the day, we wanna be comfortable. We just want to be comfortable. We want a routine. We want, we want to feel like we've arrived. And there's nothing wrong with wanting that so long as it comes with alignment with God's plan and intimacy with his presence. His plan and his presence can bring those things. But when we want those things and we don't want the presence, that's when perfection becomes a trap. So I spoke earlier of comfort, and that's the next state of being I want to jump into, which is we, it is in our DNA to be perfected, but it's also in our DNA to be comforted. You break up this word comfort, it's two parts. The first part is to call. The second part means near or next to. I said, huh, that's interesting. It says nothing about feeling good. It says nothing about everything going great. It doesn't say anything about my plan is working. It doesn't say anything about being flawless. It just says to call or to be near or next to. The next time you hear the word comfort, I want you to think, I can call on God and I'm near and next to him. That is comfort. Your greatest comfort is to be able to call on God and know that he is near and next to you. I often think of, 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 of Adam and Eve and how they walked in the garden. And it says that they walked with God. Like I walk with God. I know he's there, but they had a, they had a proximity that I could only like imagine. This is comfort. And I love this because if we look at Psalm 145, 18 through 20, it says the Lord is near to all who call upon him and to all who call upon him in truth. It is in our DNA to be comfortable, but not comfortable in that worldly sense, but comfortable in a sense that we call on God and he's near to us. That's my comfort. My comfort doesn't come from my circumstance. My comfort doesn't come from what's happening around me. My comfort doesn't come from my confidence in my perspective. There's nothing outside of me that dictates my comfort. My comfort comes from my relationship with God, where I can call on him and know he's near to me. And no matter what is happening around me, no matter what is happening within me, 
I call on him and daddy's right there. That's comfort. That's the real comfort. So this real perfection is constantly being uh, adjusted and aligned and being worked by God. This real comfort that we are now aware of that is a part of our DNA is to know that we can be close to him and call on him. I wrote this down. I hope and I pray this blesses somebody. Proximity fosters alignment. Say it again. Proximity fosters alignment. The closer you are to God, the more your alignment with his plan and his purpose, the more the obedience muscle on the inside of us is worked and strengthened, the more elevated and higher our thought processes become. Proximity fosters alignment. You want to get in alignment? We have to be intimate and get close to him. And in order to get intimate and close to God, in order to experience this comfort, we got to set aside time for him. And this is all in what Paul is saying to the, to the church of Corinth so they can finally get a hold of the mess that was happening on the inside of them. So we understand the idea of being perfected. We understand the idea of being comforted. And I cannot say this enough. This is in our DNA. This is not, this is not an optional thing. This is a part of who we are. This is a part of our identity is to do this. So now that we've moved on to the, with the understanding of being perfected and being comforted, I want to move on to this next uh, portion of the verse. Be of one mind. Now, I believe we've had this one a little mixed up for a while. I want to clear this up. You see, a lot of us, when we think of being of one mind, it means we think the same thing. So, you know, you meet up with your buddy and it's like, oh, I'm studying Ephesians 6. And your buddy goes, oh, I'm studying Ephesians 6. We're one-minded, yay! That, <laughs> that ain't it. That's cool if that happens, but that's not completely it. You break up this word one mind. It says be of one mind. Now, one is interesting because one is a baffling wind. I said, okay, God, that's different. And literally, it's described, it's a wind that is so strong that you can't explain it. it you, you, you have no words for how strong this wind is moving. So, okay, and this is in the word one. Now, we have the definition, which means single, but tucked in there is a baffling wind. And then the mind is interesting, too. This word mind breaks down to midriff or diaphragm. It's an indication of your feelings. But the idea of it is, it is your core. I said, wow, I thought we were talking about the mind and the brain, but it sounds a lot more like we're talking about the, the respiratory system and how we, we take in and we, and we breathe out. And so I was like, Lord, bring this together because it sounds like we're talking about two different organs when in fact we're talking about the same thing just in a slightly different way. When Paul is speaking of being of one mind, what he's really saying is this baffling wind, this wind that is so strong that you can't explain it, is supposed to be a, a, a measurement of how strong our intake and our, ex, and our exhaling of the word of God is in our lives. We should be taking the word of God in so strong and we should be living out the word of God so strong with such force that it is a baffling thing. The, the inertia being created by taking in the word of God and breathing out the word of God and being the word of God is such a strong thing. And that's why I love the definition of mind being your midriff is your diaphragm. It is your core. So in other words, when we condition our minds to consistently take in the word of God and breathe out and be the word of God and live out the word of God. And we do it consistently with such force. Eventually, our thoughts, our mind, our thoughts become shaped around the word of God. The word of God becomes our core. Alignment brings proximity. So now that we are close to God, we can breathe him in. We can breathe in his word and we can live out. I'm not going to just say regurgitate his word. I said live out. 
Let me, let me come back to that one. It's not enough to learn the verse and just spit it out. I'm talking about learn the verse, dig in the verse, find the hidden code, breathe it in, and then live it out. Don't just say it out. We have to live it out. And we do it on such a consistent basis that our thoughts are now shaped. They revolve around the word of, the, of, the word of God. I got so excited, I almost tripped myself up. Can you imagine walking around on an everyday basis and every thought you have centers around a word? There are no loose thoughts in your mind. Every thought you have is centered around a word. Family, I would love to tell you I'm there. I'm working on it. But I'm praying that with the revelation that comes from this experience tonight, we all work on it and get together about it too. And this is what being one-minded is. Oh, I love this. Being one-minded doesn't mean we're both thinking the same scripture. Oh, being one-minded means we're both thinking of the same God. And because we're both meditating and taking in and living out the same God, God can take a word from you and take a word from me and bring that word together in the right circumstance and bring forth a breakthrough and bring forth a shift and open up a dimension and open up the, the windows of heaven and pour out that which you cannot have room for. This happens when we are of one mind. I'm not just talking about spitting the same scripture back and forth. It means our thoughts are all centered around the word and the presence of God. Be one-minded. At the core of everything we're thinking is a word. And if we're thinking it and we can't trace it back to a word, that means that thought has to go. This one is for free. Just because the thought enters your mind, it don't mean you have to keep it. You can kick thoughts out. I do it all the time. I have all kinds of stupid thoughts, ridiculous thoughts, thoughts that make zero sense. They enter in my mind. I'm like, I don't even have time to figure out how you got here. This doesn't make any sense. Beat it. You can do that when you set yourself up the system and the process of thinking, the habit and the, the, the mindset of Every thought I have revolves around, at the core of every thought I have is a word from God. And then we guard those words because this means now my mind is on my word and your mind is on your word. Oh, this is about to save somebody. My mind is on my word. Your mind is on your word. That means I keep my mind on mine. You keep your mind on yours. A lot of times what happens is we start to mind someone else's word because we feel we have an interpretation and we feel we have insight and we feel, and I preface it, I keep saying we feel, I didn't say the Lord said, I said we feel we have knowledge and we feel we have an opinion. And so somebody has a word that God is working inside of them and we have an observation and we have an expectation and we have something else that we feel we want to add to that and help them along. Let me save you. Let me save me. Let's save all the believers some trouble. Mind your word. Keep your mind on your word. I'll keep my mind on my word. And when God brings us together with, some, with an observation for both of us, we can share that. But mind your word. Mind my word. Put that in the comments. Mind your word. Mind your word. Mind your word. Mind your word. Keep your mind off of someone else's word and keep your mind on your own. And it will make life a lot simpler. And the most important thing is we can be effective and truly be one-minded. So, we are called to be perfected in our DNA. We are called to be comforted in our DNA. We are called to be one-minded in our DNA. This last point I want to make says to be at peace. And I found this interesting because it says, live in peace. I said, okay. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. 
So I had to look up the word peace because I figured, you know, peace is chill, it's relaxed, it's kumbaya, I'm minding my business, you know, the grass is, is green and everything is chill and it's, it's close, but not quite. One of the definitions of peace, <laughs> to be exempt from the havoc of war. So, wow, okay. To be exempt from the havoc of war. Not to be exempt from war, to be exempt from the havoc of war. I said, oh, Paul, you put some code in here. You put some serious code in here. You got to really dig in deep to see this. I said, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that if I walk with God and I do everything he tells me to do and I'm perfected and I'm comfortable, I'm doing all these things, there's still going to be war? Absolutely. Without question. The world is showing us that right now. I can point to 2 Corinthians. It says in 2 Corinthians 10, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapons of our warfare, not the weapons of our peace fair. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down arguments, the thoughts, the thoughts. Casting down arguments, we're back to the thoughts. The thoughts revolving around the word of God. And if they don't revolve around the word of God, you cast them down. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We have weapons at our disposal. This is in our DNA. Somebody needs to hear this. It's in your DNA to fight. It's in your DNA to fight the thoughts that enter in your mind and try to set up residence in a place God did not give them authority in. It's in your DNA. It's not a suggestion. It's more than a fact. It is your identity to fight for the space in your mind. It is a part of my identity to tell thoughts that do not speak to who God has told me I am to leave. And he has given me the weapons to do so. So if we're really talking about peace, it's not about the absence of war. It's about being exempt from the havoc of war. You look up this word havoc, havoc speaks of waste. Havoc also speaks of chaos. So you're telling me that it is in my DNA to be able to war, but not be affected, to be exempt from, oh, glory be to God, to be exempt from the waste and the chaos of war. I can engage in war, watch this, I can engage in war, I can have my victory, and I don't have to deal with the waste and the chaos. That's what happens when we are in these states of being. This is what happens when we lay hold of the code, when we crack the code and we see what is in our DNA as Christians. We get to war and war on his behalf and the havoc and the waste that the rest of the world has to deal with, we are exempt from. We in the fight, we fight different. We're in the struggle, but we struggle different. My victory doesn't look like everybody else's victory because my victory isn't a victory that's strictly based on what I see. My victory is based on who I am. My victory is based on who God has told me I am. My victory is based on where God has shown me we're going to go because I've spent the time to be perfected and to be comforted and to be at peace with him, I have become so one-minded. My thoughts have revolved around the word of God so closely and so vociferously that now my victory is set. Get that in the comments. My victory is set. My victory is set. My victory is set. Get it down. Victory is in my DNA. Victory is in my DNA. You were built, literally made, handcrafted by God to be victorious. And this comes from a real state of peace. Peace is not about being able to do nothing. Peace is alignment in God with whatever you do.
I'll say that again. Peace is not doing nothing. Everybody wants peace, and sometimes we confuse peace and rest. I'm not talking about stillness. Peace is alignment with God in whatever you do, which means wherever God places you, whatever God gives you to do, as long as you're doing it, you're at peace. If God says rest and you're resting, you're at peace. If God says war against that thing and you're at war, you're at peace. If God says, I need stillness all over your life, you're at peace. If God says, I need to accelerate you and I need you to move in such a way faster than you've ever moved in your life, quicker and with more conviction and with more obedience than I've ever moved in my life. If God says these things to me and I'm in alignment with him and I obey, I'm in peace. That's the real peace. Paul said all this to the church of Corinth. This is a low key war cry. No wonder he had to put it in code. I can't imagine what his captors would have said had, he, had they read this letter and be like, well, oh, you're trying to excite your people. We can't have this. He said, no, 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 brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace and the God of love and peace shall be with you. He sent them a nice little love letter. But it was, it was way deeper than that. And, and for us, I want us to understand, it was, it's always way deeper than what you see on the page. This part ain't even in my notes. In this season, especially with uh, Easter having recently passed, I want you to study the word of God. I'm not just saying this because I'm a pastor and I love the word of God. I'm saying this because I'm a pastor and I love the word of God and I've seen how effective it is in everyone across the board. I have spoken to people who do not believe and will read the word of God and you see the shift. There's a shift, there's power. All you have to do is study it, dig into it. Don't be afraid to see a word, watch this, and look up the meaning. I guess we got tired of doing it when we were little because I know my moms used to do this to me all the time. So I'd be like, hey, what does this word mean? Look in the dictionary. Oh, mom, you know what the word means? Look in the dictionary. Now I know why she does it, does it, did it. Because she created a hunger in me. She created a way of thinking in me and a pathway and a process of thought which says, yes, I see the word. And yes, I know what that word normally means, but today might be a new day because I serve a new God every day. He's gonna give me a new wisdom every day. He's gonna me, give me next level discernment every day. So everything that's in front of me, everywhere I go, it can look completely the same Monday through Thursday, but Friday, all of a sudden, the building has a different meaning. The people in the building have a different meaning. The word God gave me suddenly has a different meaning, and I can apply all of it right now as long as I stay hungry. And as long as I understand what's in my DNA, which is to be perfected, which is to be comforted, which is to be one-minded and to be at peace. Every time I encounter the word of God, that is my expectation. I'm looking to the word of God to corroborate what is already in my DNA. And if I'm ever confused about my DNA, I go right back to the word of God. I go right back to the creator. I go right back to the one who wrote the code to begin with. And so this is what Paul was bringing to his people. This was the gift. This was the last gift he gave them. And I know Paul was exasperated. Ooh, I know the feeling. I used to teach. I'm teaching right now, but I mean, I used to teach like public school teaching with little kids. And there's nothing harder than teaching something where you know you have explained it every single way possible. And you know you explained it perfectly well. And the kids are just like not getting it. It, 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 it your, your brain almost short circuits. And so what Paul did, he said, I can't teach you guys anymore. I can't give you any more reasoning for who Jesus is. I can't give you more, any more reasoning for his power. I can't give you any more reasoning, more explanations of why you should follow him and why you need to be more like him. But here's what I can give you. I give you the code. I give you your genetic code. I'm gonna give you your DNA. And now, wherever you go and whatever you see, whatever doesn't match up with this DNA, you know it, you spot it, you can get rid of it and keep moving forward so that this church can stop stumbling on all of the little things. Paul was a G. 
I, I respect Paul for this. I probably would have lost my patience and I'd have probably been done with it, but that's why that wasn't my anointing. <laughs> and so fam, the reason this message burned in my heart is the timing. One of the things that, that I've always noticed uh, is, and I mentioned earlier, recently uh, Easter passed and we celebrate, we, we, we get into, into this season of Lent where we sacrifice something so we can become closer to God and so the Lenten season brings sacrifice. And then we get towards the end of the Lenten season and we start to, to speak and, and meditate on the crucifixion uh, of Jesus. And so we're deep in our, and it's a deep revelation of who Jesus is. And then we, we, we are studying him and we start to, you know, our feelings are really wrapped up in our study and in our revelation. And then he's resurrected. And so there's this spiritual, emotional roller coaster that is Easter. And then once Resurrection Sunday happens, it's like, it's like falling off a cliff. All of a sudden, Jesus is resurrected, and that's it. And then it's just Monday again. And I want to avoid that happening with us. Family, I want us to understand that everything Jesus went through was not to show us who he was. He went through it to show us who we were. He overcame to show us what was in us. He overcame to show us who we really were. He overcame to show us what was in our DNA from the beginning. And so I'm praying that with these states of being, that you are reevaluating how you view yourself in this season. Don't lose the fervor. Don't lose the intensity. Don't lose the intensity and the intimacy that comes when we enter into that Easter season and then we come out of the Easter season. Uh, I heard Pastor Stephen Furtick say something. He actually said it a couple times and it blew me away. He said one of the hardest things for him to do is to preach uh, a message where everybody's familiar with the passage. Because if you know the passage, then it's hard to teach people who think they already know. Family, I don't want us to be people who think we already know. Because if I thought I already knew, I would have missed this war declaration that Paul sent to the church of Corinth. I would have missed, I would have never cracked the code on what Paul was sending to the church of Corinth. This wasn't a sweet goodbye. This was a masterful hello. This wasn't a, my mission is over and now it's time for me to take a nap. This was, I need you all to wake up. And I'm praying right now, you can put that in the comments, I'm done and we're gonna, and we're gonna pray out, received, 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 received. Crack the code, crack the code and take your DNA markers with you and remember who God created you to be. I'll go over them again. We are to be perfected. We are to be comforted. We are to be one-minded. And we are to be, we are to live, I'm sorry, in peace. And if anything, anything, anything comes against or violates your DNA, you know it's not of him and you know it's not really you. And then you pull out the weapons you have of, at your disposal and you do what you have to do, which means get rid of it and get rid of it fast. I'm gonna leave with this. I want, we saw what the verse, uh, how the verse read in the beginning. I wanna take a stab at this translation. This is not some official translation, so don't go Googling it. You just have to come back here in the archives, read it again, listen to it again, and write it down. We know what it said originally. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind. Live in peace and the God of love and peace shall be with you. So what this really meant was do well. Remain in a state of repair with God. Call out to God, stay close to him. Center your thoughts around him and his word. 
exempt yourself from the havoc of war, and God will be with you and bring his love and peace. This is the last thing Paul gave to the church of Corinth, and this is what I offer to all of us. At the end of the day, it is about reclaiming our DNA. Let's crack the code. So Father, I thank you. I honor and I praise you. I thank you that you have brought forth the spirit of truth. I pray, Father God, that your word has indeed worked a mighty and wondrous thing in the lives of those who needed to hear it. Father, we are reclaiming our DNA. We are reclaiming our birthright. We are reclaiming all that Jesus showed us in his journey here on earth. We are reclaiming our right to be exactly who you have birthed us to be, sons and daughters of the Most High God who know what is in our DNA and will accept nothing less from this moment. And for those of you who it is your first time here, let me say this prayer for you. I pray right now that the rebirth that happens when Christ is introduced to you in a fresh and new way, may the spirit of rebirth set upon you right now. I pray that you begin a fresh new journey with the Lord, with his word, and that knowing that every, even this church that we spoke about today, the church of Corinth had its stumbles and its struggles, you will too, but as long as you have your DNA, you can always have the fullness of the identity God knew and put in you in the very beginning. So I thank you, Father, for this experience. I thank you, Father, for this exchange. And I pray, oh Lord, that you continue to have your way in everyone's lives, that we now know who we are because of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Family, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for spending this rich, rich time with us. I pray your week is incredible. I pray you have another God encounter, and we love you.